Just as a note before this video starts, none of my descriptions in this video will be overly gruesome or disgusting, so if you're on the edge about whether or not you want to watch a video about cannibalism, I suggest sticking around, as this video is more about events where cannibalism was committed rather than how it was committed. Also, my microphone broke right as I was about to start recording, so I am going to have to record this on a blue snowball, so I apologize in advance for the audio. Cannibalism has always been interesting to me, and I've wanted to make a video covering some sort of cannibalism for a long time, as strange as that might sound. Fortunately for me, an icebergcharts.com user by the name of Trust No One made an incredibly lengthy iceberg chart pertaining to the subject. The creator has made it very clear that they don't want anyone to use this iceberg without crediting them, so I'm also going to make it very clear now that this is not mine and everything on it belongs to them. Moving on, I'm sure that all of you know by now how an iceberg works, but for the 1% of you that don't, it's basically just a fancy way to categorize entries of the same topic into a chart. Those entries growing progressively darker and more obscure the further down the chart you go. I'm not entirely sure how I'll be breaking this iceberg up, as some tiers are longer than others, but I'm definitely not going to be doing it all in this video. If this video is received positively, then I'll most likely make a follow-up video. Also, there's unfortunately nothing I can show up on screen besides a few pictures here and there, so this will mainly be an audio-based video, and I encourage you to turn this video on in the background of whatever you're doing. But for those of you who want to watch whatever background footage I've got going on, be my guest. And without further ado, let's jump into the cannibalism iceberg. Just kidding. Before we get into the cannibalism iceberg, I'd like to mention that there's probably no way this video is getting monetized, so allow me to introduce today's sponsor, Audible. Audible is the leading provider in audio-based entertainment. With thousands of titles coming from a myriad of categories, there will never be a moment where you don't have anything new to listen to. This includes categories such as audiobooks, podcasts, comedy, and Audible originals you won't find anywhere else. I'm the type of person who likes having something to listen to while playing video games or researching video topics, so if you're anything like me, then you'll enjoy Audible. Audible users are given a credit a month to pick any title they want, along with two Audible originals from a monthly selection, and you can keep your credits for up to a year before you have to decide on what you want. By using the link audibletrial.com slash nightfare, you can sign up for an absolutely free 30 day trial, and by doing so, you support this channel. That's audibletrial.com slash nightfare. Thank you to Audible for sponsoring this video. Headhunters Headhunting is the act of hunting a human with the intent on collecting their severed head or other body parts after killing them, specifically so that those body parts can act as trophies, signifying how many people you've hunted slash killed. It can also be done for religious or spiritual beliefs depending on what region or group of people you're looking at. Headhunting doesn't have to be specifically for cannibalistic purposes, but there are people who do it for that purpose. An example being the Marind Anim, an ethnic group in New Guinea who have historically hunted people and then ate their flesh for ritualistic purposes. Donner Party The Donner Reed Party was a group of American pioneers who were traveling by wagon from the Midwest to California. During their migration, they were caught up in the Sierra Nevada mountain range during the winter of 1846 and 1847. After about four months of being caught up in the mountain range, rescuers came from California to aid the pioneers, but only 48 out of the entire 87 members lived through the whole ordeal. After various interviews with the surviving pioneers, many confessed to having eaten their fellow party members due to their dwindling food supply throughout the entire ordeal. However, as a rebuttal, some of the pioneers also deny this claim by saying that it was only the children who were fed other members, or that it didn't happen at all. Some people even let spill their darkest secrets concerning the event, like Jean-Baptiste Trudeau, who confessed in detail how he ate a baby raw, along with eating another member, Jacob Donner. This brings up the idea of committing taboo to survive. 
If the only way to survive is through cannibalism, then should that or should that not be looked upon poorly? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Alfred Packer Alfred Packer, also known as the Colorado Cannibal, was an American prospector who attempted to traverse the San Juan Mountains in 1874 with five other men. However, when he returned home, he was completely alone, and there was no sign of his companions. While being questioned about what happened to his colleagues, two Ute tribesmen burst into the police agency with strips of dried human flesh that were found on the hill near where the police were searching. Packer reportedly saw the flesh and fainted. The whole situation spiraled until Packer eventually signed a confession stating the true events of the expedition, which I will now quote. Old Man Swan died first, and was eaten by the other five persons about ten days out of camp. Four or five days afterwards, Humphreys died and was also eaten. He had about $133. I found the pocketbook and took the money. Sometime afterwards, while I was carrying wood, the butcherer was killed, as the other two told me accidentally, and he was also eaten. Bell shot California with Swan's gun, and I killed Bell. Shot him. I covered up the remains and took a large piece along, then traveled 14 days into the agency. Going by Packer's word, it doesn't seem like he was the one who killed all of his men, he just happened to eat a few of them. Nevertheless, on June 8, 1886, Packer was convicted on five counts of voluntary manslaughter and sentenced to 40 years in prison. Autosarcography, aka self cannibalism. There are many instances of self-cannibalism in life. There's little things like biting your nails or accidentally swallowing a bit of dead skin from your lip, and then there's big things that we often attribute to the word cannibalism, like eating your own arm. Whether it be to survive in unfortunate circumstances or to fulfill some sort of desire, the act of autosarcography happens every day and flies under many people's radars, even the ones who commit it. Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm not going to go in detail about the many crimes of Jeffrey Dahmer, but just the cannibalistic side of him. Most of you know that Jeffrey Dahmer, the American serial killer, is also known as the Milwaukee Cannibal. This is because he would eat various parts of many of his victims. On several occasions, that would include eating the heart. We're not exactly sure how many people Dahmer ate, but I've read that out of his 17 total victims, the number he cannibalized was probably around 10 or 11. Dahmer said that he would prepare the human meat, usually thighs and other organs, with a meat tenderizer, salt, pepper, and A1 steak sauce. Allegedly, Dahmer would pretend that his prison food was a person, and he would shape his food into limbs before eating it. This behavior eventually led to him being beaten to death in a prison shower with a 20-inch metal bat by a fellow inmate, Christopher Scarver. In his defense, Scarver told the authorities that God made him do it and that he had not planned anything in advance, although the metal bat that he hid in his clothing says otherwise. Agori the Aghori are a group of 70 ascetic Shaiva sadhus inhabiting the state of Uttar Pradesh in northern India. From what I've read, this sect collects dead bodies that have been dumped into the Ganges River and then uses them for a multitude of religious purposes. These purposes include covering themselves in cremation ashes, creating altars out of dead bodies, meditating on dead corpses, and eating rotten human flesh. They do things that the common person would see as macabre because the Agori don't see anything as clean or dirty. They just see everything as one and are therefore willing to do things that most won't. As Agori translates to not fearful or fearless. Countess Bathory Elizabeth Bathory was a Hungarian noble and alleged serial killer back in the late 16th and early 17th century. Elizabeth and four of her servants were accused of torturing and killing hundreds of girls aged 10 through 14 from the years 1590 to 1610, which eventually led to her servants being arrested and convicted, while Elizabeth was only confined to her home for punishment. It's not exactly known what Elizabeth did to her victims. Some say that she burned the girls with hot metal rods and then made them jump into freezing cold water, and some say that she bathed in their blood of her victims while committing cannibalism here and there. 
Obviously, no one can say for sure, though, considering how long ago it happened. It's also suspected that Elizabeth was actually framed for this, considering how she was the owner of a large amount of wealth and land after the passing of her husband. Again, we'll never know the truth since this happened 400 years ago. Michael Rockefeller As opposed to everyone else we've covered so far, Michael Rockefeller didn't actually commit cannibalism. He was the one who got eaten. Long story short, Michael Rockefeller, son of former U.S. Vice President Nelson Rockefeller, went missing in 1961 after his boat sank three miles from shore during an expedition near Netherlands, New Guinea. The reason this is on the iceberg is because the inhabitants of the region he was exploring were well known to be cannibals, leading some people to believe that Michael swam to shore and was eaten by the locals. After multiple investigations into the disappearance, Local villagers and elders admitted to eating Michael, however there's no proof to back this up. The only proof we have is that the skull of Michael Rockefeller was given to an investigator who in turn gave it to the Rockefeller family for a cash prize, however this cannot be confirmed. This was a very summarized version of the incident, so if you're interested then I suggest you watch the video Wendigoon made on the subject, a link will be in the description. Hansel and Gretel I'm sure everyone is familiar with the story of Hansel and Gretel, but if you're not, or just need a refresher, allow me to regale you. Hansel and Gretel is a German fairy tale in which a brother and sister are abandoned in the forest, where they eventually stumble upon a gingerbread house. Inside the house lives a witch who lures the siblings inside and traps them in iron cages. Over the course of a few weeks, the witch feeds Hansel candy and sweets in order to fatten him up while Gretel is treated as a servant and rarely gets to eat. Eventually, the witch decides it's time to eat Hansel, so she asks Gretel to make sure the oven is hot enough by having her reach to the back. Gretel realizes that the witch is trying to trap her in the oven, so she tricks the witch by feigning ignorance, leading the witch to demonstrate what Gretel needs to do before Gretel shoves her in the oven and locks the door. Gretel frees Hansel from his iron cage, and they live happily ever after. The reason I believe that this is on the iceberg is because it's such a mainstream story, but everyone overlooks the cannibalistic elements behind it. This witch was seriously about to eat a child, and most everyone who reads the story thinks it's just another innocent fairy tale. Wendigo A Wendigo is a mythological creature that appears in many Algonquian-speaking native beliefs. Wendigos are most often depicted as giant, gaunt, decaying humanoids with antlers that roam the forest looking for people to kill and eat. In some traditions, if a human ends up committing cannibalism, they will turn into a wendigo, which is why they will continue to eat humans even after their transformation, although this belief is not shared everywhere. There is also the possibility that someone can be possessed by a wendigo and then have a craving for human flesh, driving them to commit cannibalism. If you've watched my video on the disturbing reddit post iceberg, I've talked about the foot taco before, but for those of you who are new here, let me explain. Exactly 4 years ago from the time of writing this script, a reddit user made an ask me anything post describing how he got into a motorcycle accident and ended up with shattered bones in his foot. The foot needed to be amputated, and after the procedure was completed, OP asked the doctor if he could keep the foot. Long story short, with the help of a few friends, OP cooked his foot meat into a few tacos that they ended up eating. This one is surprisingly interesting because it shows how people can have different views on cannibalism. I personally would not partake in the foot tacos, but OP and his friends must have been completely fine with it. From Hell Letter the From Hell letter, also known as the Lusk letter, was a letter sent by someone who claimed to be Jack the Ripper to the chairman of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, George Lusk. This letter was sent in 1888, at the height of Jack the Ripper's crimes, so it was obviously taken seriously. That's not to say that people didn't pretend to be Jack the Ripper, as all serial killers have people who send in letters pretending to be them. But what's truly special about this letter is that it was sent in alongside half of a preserved human kidney. The letter reads as follows. From Hell, Mr. Lusk. 
I send you half the kidney I took from one woman and preserved it for you. The other piece I fried and ate. It was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out, only if you wait a while longer. Signed, Catch Me When You Can, Mr. Lusk. So this alleged Jack the Ripper claims to have fried and ate the other half of the kidney. I have no clue if this is actually Jack the Ripper or not. Part of me thinks that it is because they literally sent in a kidney as proof. If this really is from Jack the Ripper, then this would confirm that he was a cannibal, as that's not something we can be 100% sure of at the moment. This is of course assuming that he's telling the truth in the letter. Miracle of the Andes On the 13th of October 1972, Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571 would crash into the Andes Mountains after the co-pilot started descending before they reached their destination. Out of the 45 passengers and crew members that were on the flight, 11 of them died from the impact, and only 16 of them would eventually be rescued two months after the crash occurred. If you're intuitive, then you can probably guess why this is on the iceberg. When the 16 survivors were received, they told their rescuers that they had survived on cheese and herbs, as they planned to tell the real truth to only their closest family members that they had survived by committing cannibalism on the dead passengers. But eventually the word got around after investigators discovered a half-eaten human leg near where the survivors were located. The survivors held a press conference to confess that they committed cannibalism, but also to explain that a pact was made between all of the survivors to sacrifice their flesh and meat for food if they happened to succumb to the elements. The backlash eventually died down as more and more people understood the situation that the survivors were in. Ed Jean Ed Jean was an American murderer and body snatcher that lived in Plainfield, Wisconsin during the 1900s. He was most known for fashioning human bones and skins into freakish and disgusting trophies. On November 16th of 1957, a hardware store owner named Bernice Warden went missing in Plainfield. There was blood found on the floor of her store, and the cash register was open, so foul play was immediately suspected. Witnesses report that Ed Jean was the last person in the store, so he was arrested later that evening and his property was searched. The police officers found Bernice Warden's body in the shed. She was decapitated and hung by the roof from her feet also having been shot with a 22 caliber rifle. The following is a list of everything else that was on the property. Whole human bones and fragments. A waste basket made of human skin. Human skin covering several chair seats. Skulls on his bedposts. Female skulls, some with the tops sewn off. Bowls made from human skulls. A corset made from a female torso skinned from shoulders to waist. Leggings made from human leg skin. Masks made from the skin of human heads. Tavern owner Mary Hoggins' face mask in a paper bag. Mary Hoggins' skull in a box. Bernice Warden's entire head in a burlap sack. Bernice Warden's heart in a plastic bag in front of Jean's potbelly stove. Four noses. A pair of lips on a window shade drawstring. A lampshade made from the skin of a human face and fingernails from female fingers. During questioning, Jean told investigators that from the years of 1947 to 1952, he made more than 40 visits to local graveyards in order to steal recently buried bodies. After multiple trials, Jean was declared clinically insane and spent the rest of his life in a mental institute before dying of lung cancer in 1984. Before his possessions could be auctioned off in 1954, his house burned down in a mysterious fire, but no one really knows who started it and no one really cares. After writing this, I realized that no article specifically said whether or not Jean was a cannibal. And he even said himself that he wasn't a cannibal, but he's probably not the most reliable news source. Kuru Kuru is an incurable and fatal nervous system disorder that causes tremors and loss of coordination due to neurodegeneration. It was formerly common among the four people in Papua New Guinea, and its transmission was likely caused by endocannibalism, which is cannibalism within one's own community. What basically happened was dead members of the community were cooked and eaten for religious purposes. 
women and children usually consume the brain, but unfortunately that's where most of the infectious proteins were located. This led to a cycle of people getting infected and dying after eating an infected brain, which led to them being eaten and spreading their infected brain onto others. Once the four people learned how the infection was being spread, they abstained from human meat during the 60s, but it wouldn't be until the mid to late 2000s for the final victim to die from Kuru. Boone Helm Levi Boone Helm, also known as the Kentucky Cannibal, was an American serial killer back in the mid-1800s. At the age of 24, he had a tendency to drunkenly abuse his 17-year-old wife. This led to a divorce, which was paid for by his father. After bankrupting his father, Helm headed west to California in search of gold. Helm asked his cousin, Littlebury Shoot, to accompany him on his journey. To which Littlebury replied that he would, but later attempted to back out. This angered Helm, so he stabbed Littlebury in the chest, killing him. Littlebury's brothers and friends caught wind of this. They eventually caught up to Helm and captured him and sent him to an insane asylum. Helm stayed in the asylum for a bit, but eventually convinced his guard to let him go on a walk in the woods and use this opportunity to escape. He continued on his way to California, actually killing many more people in the different altercations he had along the way. He eventually teamed up with six other men, and he confessed to them that at times he had to feed on his victims. Before reaching California, he and his gang got into a fight with Native Americans that resulted in one of Helm's men being injured. This man took his own life, and then Helm proceeded to eat one of the man's legs and wrap the other one up to take with him. Upon reaching San Francisco, Helm killed a rancher which he had befriended and was living with before heading up to Oregon where he robbed and murdered people for a living. In 1862, Helm got drunk at a saloon and ended up shooting an unarmed man before fleeing the scene. While on the run, he ended up eating another fugitive that he was traveling with. He was eventually arrested, but his brother paid off all the victims that witnessed Helm's crimes, so he couldn't be convicted. But finally, he got arrested again in Montana, where he was hanged in front of a crowd of 6,000 people for his crimes. Saturn Devouring His Son Saturn Devouring His Son is the name of a painting by Spanish artist Francisco Goya sometime between 1819 and 1823. As you can probably guess, it's a painting of Saturn, or Cronus as he's known in Greek mythology, devouring his son after he was told that one of his children would eventually overthrow him. However, his sixth and final child, Jupiter, also known as Zeus, would be hidden away by Saturn's wife, until Jupiter was old enough to overthrow Saturn, just as the prophecy had predicted. And let me tell you, this is one of my favorite paintings. It looks so cool and disturbing at the same time. I've been waiting so long to put this in a thumbnail, and now I find they have an excuse to do so. Miami Zombie On May 26, 2012, a 31-year-old man named Rudy Eugene attacked a 65-year-old homeless man named Ronald Popo in Miami, Florida for allegedly stealing his Bible. So what happened was Eugene was driving to Miami Beach, Florida when his car broke down. He eventually abandoned his car and took off all his clothes as he started to head west, supposedly to seek the help of a mechanic. During his trek, Eugene stumbled upon Popo, who he, without warning, started to attack by punching him and biting his face. It would take a total of 18 minutes for the whole attack to end. Police arrived and threatened Eugene to stop attacking Popo, to which Eugene responded with a growl, before continuing to eat Popo's face. Eugene was stopped after police had to shoot him five times, killing him. Popo was immediately rushed to the hospital in critical condition. Luckily, he would end up surviving the attack, but an estimated 75-80% to 80 of his face was missing above the beard, with his left eye having been gouged out. The reason behind the attack was that Eugene accused Popo of stealing his Bible, when in reality, Eugene left his Bible in his broken down car. 
After an autopsy and toxicology report, it was suspected that Eugene was on bath salt and cannabis during the attack. Omaima Ari Nelson Omaima Nelson was an Egyptian-American model who murdered her husband with a pair of scissors and a clothes iron following him abusing her throughout their relationship. Omaima and her husband married after a few days of meeting each other and were only together for about a month until the murder happened. She killed him on Thanksgiving Day in their California apartment and then proceeded to dismember and decapitate him. Supposedly, she then cooked his decapitated head and fried his hands in oil while also mixing his body parts up with leftover Thanksgiving turkey. Omaima denies eating her husband, but the truth behind whether she did or didn't commit cannibalism is unknown. The Ruhr Hunter Joachim Kroll, also known as the Duisburg Maneater, was a German serial killer who committed his murders from 1955 to 1976. He had over 13 victims and was known for strangulation and cutting open and removing certain parts of his victims, which was what initially led investigators to believe that they were dealing with a cannibal. He was very methodical about his timing and position of his murders, so it would only be until 1976, on July 3rd, that he would be arrested. The apartment that Kroll was living in had a blocked waste pipe, so one of Kroll's neighbors in the same apartment asked if he knew anything about the blockage to which Kroll replied with, Guts. Kroll's neighbor called the police and Kroll was quickly arrested and his apartment was searched. Inside the apartment, police found frozen flesh in plastic bags, a hand in a saucepan, and body parts clogging the toilet. When interrogated, Kroll admitted to every murder that he'd committed, even ones that he wasn't suspected for, and said that he was only a cannibal to save money on groceries. Kroll thought that he would just have to go through rehabilitation, but was instead given multiple life sentences, later dying of a heart attack after spending over a decade in prison. Peter Bryan Peter Bryan was a British serial killer and cannibal with schizophrenia that committed three murders between 1993 and 2004. In 1994, Brian was sent to Rampton Secure Hospital in Nottinghamshire after admitting to the murder of a 21-year-old Nisha Sheff, who he beat to death with a hammer the year prior. I'm assuming that it was around this time that he was diagnosed with schizophrenia, as he didn't serve any prison time for his murder. By 2001, the staff of the rehabilitation hospital believed that he had significantly improved, and by 2002, he was moved to Riverside Hostel in London, where he was able to freely come and go from the building. Social workers attempted to transfer Brian to low support accommodation, but were unable to after rumors of him assaulting a 16-year-old girl, so he was moved to an open psychiatric ward. A month later, he was discharged from his mental health unit, and approximately three hours later, he would go on to kill his friend Brian Cherry on the 17th of February 2004. Officers found that Brian was cooking a portion of Cherry's dismembered brain before he was caught for the murder. Brian was sent off to a different hospital, this time Broadmoor Hospital, but still, only months later, he would go on to kill a fellow patient on April 25th, stating that had he not been interrupted, he would have eaten his victim's flesh. Under a year later, on March 15th of 2005, Brian was sentenced to life in prison. SS Dumaru and the SS Earnmore I decided to combine these two entries because they're relatively short and fairly similar. The SS Dumaru was an American ship that was struck by lightning off the coast of Guam in 1918. Everyone on the Dumaru had to evacuate to two lifeboats and one raft. The one raft that had a total of five passengers was rescued nine days later, but the two lifeboats with a total of 41 passengers on them ended up drifting out on the Pacific Ocean for three weeks. One of the lifeboats had 9 passengers aboard, while the other had 32. Passengers of the overcrowded lifeboat quickly found themselves low on food, meaning that they had to resort to cannibalism, specifically eating the other passengers who had died from exposure to the elements. Similarly, the SS Earnmore was a British ship that sank in 1889, but only 11 of 24 crew members total made it to a single lifeboat. 
The remaining 11 didn't necessarily kill each other, though it was attempted, but they did end up dismembering and eating most of the survivors who died while in the lifeboat. Four of them ended up dying, meaning that only seven survivors were found. This is yet another case where people had to commit cannibalism to survive, although this time it's a bit more extreme, as the survivors try to kill each other for food. Francis Spate the Francis Spate is similar to the previous entries, as it's a ship whose members resorted to cannibalism, but this time it was left up to luck to see who was eaten. On December 3rd of 1835, a snowstorm off the coast of Canada washed away all provisions that the crew had on deck and ruined their water supplies. After starving for 15 days, the captain suggested killing and eating one of the younger crew members, as all the older ones had family members waiting for them back home. The four youngest members casted lots on who should be eaten, and it was a 15-year-old named Patrick O'Brien who was the unlucky winner. The captain ordered the cook to kill O'Brien, but when the cook refused, the captain took it upon himself to cut the boy's throat. The remaining crew members cannibalized O'Brien for three days until three other crew members died from dehydration and starvation, leading to them being cannibalized as well. As the next lot was about to be drawn, the crew was spotted by an American ship and later saved. Eleven of the crew members out of the original 18 survived. Three died in the snowstorm and four were eaten by the crew members. Blood Jam during the Renaissance period in Europe, cannibalism was a major part of healing and medical techniques. To be honest, I had no clue this was true. The entry Blood Jam refers to a recipe created by a Franciscan apothecary in 1869. I don't know if it's against TOS to explain such a recipe, but I'll read it out anyways. Just as a precaution, do not make Blood Jam. We have scientifically progressed past the need for Blood Jam. Okay, so the first step is to extract blood from a warm and moist person who is plump and red in complexion. After that, place it upon a flat, smooth table of soft wood, and cut it up into thin little slices, allowing the watery part to drip away. When it is no longer dripping, place it on a stove on the same table and stir it to batter with a knife. When it is absolutely dry, place it immediately in a warm bronze mortar and pound it forcing it through a sieve of finest silk. When it has all been sieved, seal it in a glass jar, and renew it in the spring of every year. Blood jam would have been used to stop nosebleeds or to stop wounds from bleeding by applying it to the bleeding surface. Doctors would use fresh blood and powdered blood for the same purpose. Like I mentioned, there is no need for blood jam nowadays. People back in the 1600s believed that drinking blood from a recently deceased person would cure epilepsy, so their scientific knowledge was obviously not the best. King's Drops Coming from the same article about 17th century European cannibalism, King's Drops is a term used to refer to distilled powder skulls that were used to be mixed into liquids such as wine. The term comes from the English King Charles II, who paid £6,000 to a local professor to come up with a recipe for distilled powder skulls. Like I said, the powder would be mixed into a liquid, and then if you drank it, it would help cure a variety of different ailments. A woman named Anne Dormer wrote a letter to her sister in 1686 that said, I apply myself to tend my crazy health, and keep up my weak, shattered carcass, broken with restless nights and unquiet days. I take the king's drops and drink chocolate, and when my soul is sad to death, I run and play with the children. So for example, you could mix it with chocolate, and it would cure your tiredness. Once again, I don't advise that you try this. Big Lurch Born on September 15th, 1976, Antron Singleton, also known by his stage name Big Lurch, is an American rapper who is currently serving a life sentence for murdering his 21-year-old roommate named Tanisha Issei. As testified by Issei's boyfriend, he and Singleton spent the night prior to the murder smoking PCP. When Issei was eventually found in her apartment by her friend Alyssa Allen, her chest had been torn open with a 3-inch blade that was found broken off in her shoulder. Bite marks were found on her face and on her lungs, which had been removed from her chest. 
Singleton was promptly arrested, and a medical examination showed that he had human flesh in his stomach that wasn't his. He's now serving a life sentence at California State Prison. Let me just mention that that was probably the most gruesome thing that I'll read in this part, and I don't plan on reading anything too much more gruesome in the future, but that might change. I've already cut out a few things that I just think are too disgusting or violent for no good reason. I really want to focus on what makes people cannibalize and the meaning behind it, rather than all the gory details, but, you know, they're occasionally okay. Stanley Dean Baker On July 13th of 1970, California Highway Patrol reported a hit and run at Big Sur, in which two men sped away after hitting three people. The men were eventually caught and questioned, one of those men being Stanley Dean Baker. To quote Baker, he told the police that, I have a problem, I'm a cannibal. And then he reached into his pocket and pulled out a human finger bone as evidence. According to Baker, he was recruited by satanic cultists from a college campus in his home state, Wyoming. To back this statement up, he showed many of the various cult-related tattoos he had. Baker swore allegiance to them, and on the cult's behalf, he performed human sacrifices. Baker also admitted to having killed the 40-year-old Robert Salem in 1970. Salem was nearly decapitated and his left ear was missing. There were also paintings made in Salem's blood on the wall, cult-related messages that were meant to start a panic. After being sentenced to prison, Baker would carry on the cult's beliefs and would end up converting many other inmates to his ideologies. Ugolino and his sons Ugolino and his sons is a marble statue that was sculpted by Jean-Baptiste Carpeau in the 1860s. It depicts Ugolino from Canto 33 of Dante's Inferno, where he was said to have been imprisoned in a tower to die along with his children and grandchildren. It's unclear in both the story and the sculpture as to whether or not Ugolino ends up eating his children to stave off his hunger, but the point of this is to showcase Ugolino's expression as he contemplates committing the horrific act of eating his own children. And that about wraps up everything I had planned to talk about for part 1. I did end up cutting out a few things that I didn't think were interesting enough or couldn't get enough information on, so I suggest that you check out this iceberg for yourself and do some independent research if you're so interested. The link will be at the top of the description. Like I said, if this video is well received, then I might cover the next few tiers if my sanity permits me to do so. So make sure to let me know if you enjoyed this video in its format. Other than that, thank you for watching, and good night. Thank you.